was in uh, August of 63, and Jacqueline Kennedy went into labor and prematurely delivered the baby Patrick. I was assigned to escort the baby up to the Children's Hospital in Boston. And about 8 o'clock that night, the president arrived. And in the meantime, we had learned, of course, the baby was 4 pounds, 10 ounces, and was in grave condition. And we uh, got into the elevator. The doctor briefed the president on the condition of his son, which was not optimistic. And we got off on the ICU unit. And we passed a room where there were two delightful little girls, and uh, one had severe burns up her throat. Her bib had caught on fire, and the other girl had a similar but separate incident with burns down her arm and huge pods on the end of her hands. And, and um, President Kennedy stopped, and uh, he said, I'd like to write a note to the children. So the nurse scurries to the station and gets the name of the children, and Kennedy writes a note to each child. He just did this spontaneously. And he said, I, can you see they get this? And there was no fanfare. There was no photo op. Uh, there was no press release or anything. It was just a matter of empathy and concern for someone else. And. Then we uh, proceeded down the hall to uh, see his son, who, of course, died the next day. This was part of the dichotomy of the man. You could see so many qualities that just glowed that you couldn't see why he wanted to follow other roads that were so destructive. But after the death of Patrick, it was sort of like a metamorphosis in a sense that he was closer to her. And he saw him spend more time together uh, in the White House. Uh, she would come over to his office. I remember clearly one evening, and she came over, and I had never seen that before. And they walked back out down the airway back to the mansion. Uh, and that uh, continued up to uh, the trip to Dallas. is a targeted official by exploiting a personal weakness. In the Kennedy White House, members of the Secret Service were concerned that the president's private behavior made him a potential target. Many people came into the White House who did not know who they were. He had a tendency to surround himself with uh, ladies sometimes that uh, were a little worrisome. These women were of questionable character. Most of the other Secret Service agents and myself were worried about the fact that uh, the Russians or uh, communists or any people like that could bring in a, a ringer, so to speak. We didn't know if these women were carrying listening devices, if they had syringes that, that carried some type of poison, or if they had Pintex cameras that would photograph the president for blackmail. Possibility of blackmail and, and, and uh, things like that are astounding. Uh, who knows? I never, I never knew the name of one of the, the outsiders. One night in Seattle, we took the president up to the Olympic Hotel to secure for the night. And as we were doing that, a high-ranking uh, law enforcement official from King County had come out of the elevator with two prostitutes and was walking down toward the president's door. And a senior staff member came out of the president's suite, thanked him for bringing the girls up and took them into the suite. So one of the policemen, uh, the lieutenant, asked me, he said, does this go on all the time? And I didn't know what to say. And I said, well, we travel during the day. This only happens at night. Prostitution, uh, that's illegal. A procurement is illegal. And if you have a procurer with prostitutes paraded in front of you, then uh, as a sworn law enforcement officer, you, uh, you're asking yourself, well, what do they think of us? You were on an elite assignment. It was the most elite assignment in the Secret Service. And uh, 
you were there watching an elevator or a door because uh, the president was inside with, with two hookers. And this continued constantly. It was just not uh, once every six months, not every New Year's Eve, but it was a regular thing. And I remember one time I was with the president in Honolulu. During that trip, he went to uh, uh, Battleship Arizona and, uh, and a few other things. Uh, the president arrived at the residence about on time. I'd say within 10 minutes, uh, a staff member arrived in a car uh, escorting two ladies and they marched in the house also. This was sort of the usual routine in many stops. And a, a colonel of the Marines uh, turned to me and said, uh, uh, who are they? And I turned to him and I said, well, they're, they're um, secretaries, and I, I assume there's some work the president wants done this evening. We protected the president in many different ways. But the Honolulu episode made me angry. It didn't make me angry. We're talking about the president of the United States. And uh, I'm not a holier-than-thou guy. But he just shouldn't be doing this in public like this. There was no regard for who was there. The Marine Colonel was there. He knew what, you know, what's going on. Other people were there. The Navy people were in the house. Cooks were in the house. Yeah, you know, he's the president. He's the boss. I didn't like it, but uh, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> Nothing. The concerns of the Secret Service went beyond the dangers that prostitutes might pose. The agents learned that the president was using dangerous medication. While I was working in the White House, there was a doctor, I believe his name was Jacobson, who we used to call Dr. Feelgood. Uh, he'd uh, per periodically come to the White House with a case full of medications that possibly could have been harmful. Dr. Max Jacobson had a loyal following among celebrities in New York and Hollywood. He injected his patients with what he called vitamin shots that boosted their energy and confidence. We learned that Jacobson would inject himself too. So sometimes when he came to the White House, his speech was slurred, and he was going up to the floor or going to the pool room to give the president a shot. We assumed because he was a doctor and and had uh, permission to go to see the president that he was it was okay for him to go in. Someone took out a sample of, of what he was giving the president, and the sample mysteriously got to Bobby Kennedy, who had it analyzed, and it turned out to be amphetamines. Official logs show that Dr. Jacobson made more than 30 visits to the White House. Of course, both Russia and the United States at that time had the thermal nuclear bomb. And if the president turns around and starts having hallucinations, he was one reach from the red phone on his desk when he was taking these injections. In fact, when he was meeting Khrushchev at the summit meeting, Feel Good went with him expressly to keep the injections going to the president. The president depended on Jacobson during his first summit meeting with Khrushchev, and he continued to depend on the doctor's treatment through some of the most difficult periods of his presidency. Both Robert Kennedy and the official White House physician Janet Travell tried to convince the president he should stop seeing Jacobson, but they failed. According to Jacobson's record, he last saw the president in Florida, as he was preparing for the November trip to Dallas. Max Jacobson's medical license was revoked in 1975 after one of his patients died from acute amphetamine 